Hello, I'm Ian Williams, Assistant Professor in Geological and Atmospheric Sciences at Iowa State. This presentation is on land atmosphere interactions and Earth system models. So remember what happened when surface energy balance was coupled with photosynthesis and global climate models. This model conductance in some of the models was too efficient in shutting down transpiration in response to soil moisture drought, which led to a kind of runaway feedback in which the reduction in transpiration led to further drying of the atmosphere and further reductions in transpiration. And a similar kind of sensitivity was reported in an early version of the NCAR dynamic global vegetation model in which the uncoupled model did well in predicting the historical distribution of ecosystems, so grasses over the Great Plains. But when the model was coupled to climate allowing the vegetation to interact with and respond to climate change, the grasses were then taking over parts of the eastern U.S. forests and Amazon in the historical climate simulation, which is unrealistic. And this strong coupling was uh, attributed to sensitivity of the model to small changes in precipitation. And that takes me to the three concepts of this talk that I'll try to illustrate. The first is that feedbacks can be stabilizing or negative. As I mentioned, it's the small imbalance of those feedbacks that tells us about tipping points or the timing of when climates may transition into more uh, drought-like states. And the second is the fact that meteorological phenomena have largely been parameterized in the past. They've not been explicitly resolved in global Earth system models, but will be over the next five to 10 years. So these are phenomena like cumulus clouds and convective storms. And the challenge is that land models were not designed for use at these scales and may not be reliable at these scales. And the last concept is that even when the models are wrong, they are still useful for understanding land atmosphere interactions. And the reason is that feedbacks can be very difficult to detect by just looking at observations. So models that are missing processes can actually make predictions that when tested against observations will tell us how the system actually works. One example is that we've seen very strong positive soil moisture feedback in models, that there's a tight coupling in model correlations between soil moisture and evaporative fraction, which is not very realistic. We've shown that this excessive response to soil moisture could be alleviated by tuning soil resistance and small conductance parameters to allow for more transpiration and evapotranspiration, and that can also alleviate warm biases and climate prediction in some models. We know that soil moisture stress functions can overestimate effects of soil moisture drought. We've seen improved soil resistance parameterizations, better small conductance parameters, and incorporation of plant hydraulics. And all of this is representing plants as a limited buffer or stabilizing feedback on soil moisture drought because plants like to try to maintain an unbroken chain of water from roots to the leaves, which is an efficient conduit of water, especially at times when the top soil layer is dry, which would make soil evaporation more diffusion limited. But all of these fixes deal with coarser resolution GCMs. We don't know how these feedbacks work at the scales of clouds or if there are other feedbacks that come into play at those scales, and that's an important next step. Of course, there have been studies looking at cloud scales in terms of effects of spatial heterogeneity on clouds. So cumulus clouds are organized on the mesoscale. So surface heterogeneity can affect clouds by driving mesoscale circulations uh, in the way that a sea breeze is driven by a land ocean contrast. And these are shallow cumulus clouds shown in the figure on the bottom uh, around rivers in the Amazon basin. We have clouds with a preference for one side of the rabbit proof fence in southwest Australia, which separates natural from agricultural land. And mesoscale models have confirmed that surface heterogeneity can induce these flows in clouds. We also see evidence that spatial variations in soil moisture can favor aggregation or clustering of cumulus and realistic large eddy simulation hindcasts. On the other hand, we know that there are limitations to these effects. We know that spatial variations have to be of a certain size to be large enough to modify the updrafts of cumulus clouds. If they're too small, then internal boundary layers will form and the effects will be blended below the uh, cloud base height, which means there are wind speed and size thresholds for generation of these circulations. But a bigger reason why these effects have not made their way into parameterizations is probably because they are only looking at one aspect of what are more broadly known as secondary circulations. So secondary circulation is defined by AMS is the organized flow superimposed on a larger scale mean circulation. And the problem is that the atmosphere can drive secondary circulations on its own, or at least can modify spatial scales of the circulations. This was shown in one of the earlier studies on mesoscale flows over heterogeneous terrain. Here they're looking at two model domains, one over the southern Great Plains and one over 
the Amazon at uh, two kilometer and one kilometer horizontal resolutions with prescribed surface heat fluxes from offline SIB. And you can see surface heterogeneity in the plains in July. You see the lighter colors, cooler temperatures, and lower sensible heat flux over the grasses, and the darker shading indicating the higher surface heat, uh, sensible heat flux over the harvested winter wheat crops. And in the Amazon, you see the deforestation pattern with the road cutting through and the so-called herringbone pattern of higher sensible heat fluxes over the deforested regions. Now we're looking at the vertical velocity from early in, in the morning to the afternoon hours. And what you see is that initially the vertical velocity does resemble the spatial pattern of the heat fluxes, but then later in the simulation in the afternoon, we see the scale changes. And even the character of the circulations changes resembling these uh, elongated uh, look like horizontal convective rolls. And over the Amazon, the circulations grow larger in scale than the surface forcing. So the prevalence of atmospheric instabilities could explain why it's been difficult to observe landscape heterogeneity effects. And this also raises a new and maybe more important question, which is what are the effects of atmospherically driven secondary circulations on surface energy balance? And are, are there any feedbacks on water and carbon cycles? One caveat is that at the kilometer scale resolution, these secondary circulations are not necessarily realistic. Their strength and frequency is dependent on how efficient the boundary layer scheme is in mixing through diffusive processes. But we do know that secondary circulations are common. This is showing a reflectivity factor from S-band precipitation radar from the next RAD on two different afternoons uh, in June, where we are looking at microwave radiation reflected from precipitation-sized insects or dust in the boundary layer. These are clear air returns with the higher reflectivities indicating convergence in updrafts. And on the left, you can see horizontal boundary layer rolls aligned from south to north along the wind vector. On the right are boundary layer cells or cellular structures reminiscent of Rayleigh Bernard convection. And these domains are 100 by 100 kilometers. So uh, having a subgrid scale for a typical uh, GCM with horizontal scales of 2 to 10 kilometers of the roll structure aspect ratios of 1 to 7 times boundary layer depth. And the onset of rolls and transition from rolls to cell scales approximately with the ratio of the boundary layer height to Obakoff length, although there's not a strict definition of that threshold. And it's estimated that these types of structures may occur as often as 92% of days without precipitation during the warm season. We don't often see them because we're not looking at this kind of remote sensing, but we do often see the clouds that form on top of the circulations. So horizontal rolls may form cloud streets oriented along lines along the mean wind vector or shear vector. And this is vis visible reflectance in the red band. The image is a domain of about 200 by 200 kilometers, roughly a GCM, a couple of GCM grid cells. Frames are about five minutes, so you're looking at variability in cloud cover on the order of minutes, so shorter than the stomatal response time. You can see the transition from shallow to deep cumulus, cumulonimbus clouds or precipitating clouds is of the spreading out of this more diffuse, contiguous region of cloud ice. This is showing triggering of deep convection at the subgrid scale, which in this case may be associated with these secondary circulations or horizontal convective rolls, although they're not necessarily tied to the surface heterogeneity. And on the right, on a different day, you can see insect or dust returns early in the animation with some evidence of cellular-like organization, and quickly you see uh, development of isolated deep convective clouds and outward spreading of cold pools with gust fronts along the edges, these circular uh, spreading rings. Uh, these are cold pools and you can see the intersection of cold pools forming new convection being triggered. And uh, with surface wind measurements, uh, as the gust fronts move through the site, you can see a rapid increase. I'm not showing this here, but you can see a rapid increase in surface wind speed from these measurements in the order of 10 meters per second within minutes, often lasting several minutes and coincident with rains. So these are rain cooled down drafts that we call cold pools. So we have issues of wet sensors, challenges of non stationarity of events. These are highly transient, of course. And the way that the data is processed in 30 minute averages is not sufficient for studying these kinds of events. So you may be wondering whether these details matter for surface energy balance. And this is a figure from Baker et al. where they analyze simulations from a superparameterized Earth system model, SPCESM, 
which has a two-dimensional cloud resolving model embedded in each GCM grid cell. And they coupled this to the, to the land surface in two different ways. One is fully interactive, where the fluxes are passed between the cloud resolving model and land model at their native resolutions, and they call that SPX, just the blue dots. And the other is where the fluxes are averaged before passing to the other components. So that's SP in green. And the red is just a conventional GCM, which does not have embedded cloud resolving model. This is March in the Amazon forest in the rainy season. So looking at the figure in the late afternoon on the right, you can see gross primary productivity as a function of net radiation. You can see that the individual cloud resolving model columns, which are the blue dots, are sweeping out what looks like a light response curve. And because of the nonlinear saturation of GPP at high net radiation, the model that passes the fluxes at net, uh, native resolutions and then averages over the grid cell is averaging the low GPP from shady cloudy columns with saturated GPP from the clear sunny columns, which gives an overall lower average GPP in the large blue dot compared to the model that averages the net radiation before passing to the land surface model, which is the green dot. We see a similar effect in transpiration as a function of canopy interception or canopy evaporation, where some of the columns are dry and have only transpiration flux and others are wet and have interception flux so that the model that averages rainfall at the grid scale before passing to the land model will predict only the interception flux as all the leaves are slightly wet with no transpiration. So it does matter that these bursts of heavy precipitation, like what we saw in the radar animations at small scales, that they get resolved and have an impact on surface energy balance and partitioning of evapotranspiration. Another question at these scales is what are the model surface heat flux, are the surface heat fluxes realistic at cloud resolving or convection permitting resolutions? And one part of the question is how reliable the Monon Obakov similarity theory is at these scales. These are results from the Vortex Southeast campaign where they examined how well the similarity theory can predict surface layer vertical shear of the horizontal wind. So here they're comparing unstable fair weather days in which the theory should work to conditions in the environment of storms, which are often strongly sheared and also unstable. And within storm outflows, so in the cold pool air, which is also strongly sheared, maybe stable or unstable, depending on whether the surface is rain cooled. And the top panels are showing the wind profiles from Doppler LiDAR. Bottom panels are non-dimensional wind shear predicted by the theory for different stabilities or values of Obakov length and L uh, in, in red lines. And what you see is that the observations, which are the blue dots, are consistent with what we'd expect for an unstable surface layer where L is negative in the fair weather regime. But as you go to the more strongly sheared environments of storms and storm outflows, you see the theory begins to break down and underestimates the shear for the values of L that we would expect in these environments. So as uh, we would need a very stable surface layer in order to explain these measurements with the existing theory. And the authors go on to suggest problems with stationarity and homogeneity in uh, the assumptions of the theory, but also the logarithmic wind profile itself and lack of averaging of flow characteristics in these models that are resolving secondary circulations and outflows. One of the reasons that we care about cold pools and surface shear is that they are the primary mechanism for triggering and organizing cumulus clouds into larger systems known as MCSs and in sustaining those systems for uh, hundreds if not thousands of kilometers. This is a figure showing one case that we hindcasted in WARF uh, coupled to CLM4 at three kilometer convection permitting resolution in the Southern Great Plains domain, where we performed one reference hindcast having soil moisture and vegetation properties consistent with the observed meteorology at that period. And then another wet experiment where we perturbed soil moisture to be increased and vegetation was made more freely transpiring. And we found two time scales to the response in convection because the boundary layer becomes drier in the reference experiment, we found more numerous colliding cold pools over the drier surface. But we found better organized convection related to a buildup of cape and a shallower boundary layer over the wet surface in the wet experiment. But what's more interesting is that at shorter time scales, we found a strongly enhanced surface heat fluxes along the gust front in the wet experiment, both sensible and latent heating, so showing the latent heat flux of up to 300 watts per square meter at 1900 local time, which is well after the peak heating. So this raises questions of the role of heat storage in the soil canopy. Um, and 
suggest a different way of looking at measurements at higher temporal frequency and profiles of the canopy and surface layer to assess the heat storage. And also the use of measurements of wind shear from Doppler LiDAR, because it's the balance between cold pool induced shear and environmental shear that is thought to sustain these systems. And it turns out that resolving cold pools and convection permitting models doesn't guarantee that important aspects of MCSs are properly simulated. This is showing climatology of MCSs over 13 years, showing observed and modeled annual average MCS geneses in areas of 100 by 100 kilometers. You can see that there's a substantial underestimation of MCS genesis over the central US, even in a convection permitting model that is resolving cold pool processes. More broadly, there have been attempts to parameterize cold pools and GCMs and Earth system models that are not convection permitting. And most of these parameterizations do not take into account surface recovery of cold pools or the recovery of positive buoyancy in the cold pool air uh, by the addition of surface heat fluxes. And this can have an impact on the cold pool lifetime. And there are large eco ecological impacts of MCSs. So 500 million trees were estimated killed by a single squall line in derecho over the Amazon. And derecho is the windstorm associated with the cold pool itself. So lastly, I mentioned the idea that models can be used as tools for understanding. And I mentioned this because the parameterizations themselves are hypotheses for how some of these interactions might work. And this is increasingly true because we've had a trend toward more unified and uh, multi-scale parameterizations that are allowing for more pathways for land atmosphere interactions in these models. So this is driven by an interest in unifying the parameterization of shallow and uh, deep convective clouds to get a more seamless transition. So deep convection parameterizations are based on uh, convective available potential energy or CAPE, which is coupled to the surface through the thermodynamic influence of uh, the surface on the buoyancy of, of near surface air parcels. But shallow cumulus parameterizations and some unified cloud parameterizations are representing energy barriers to convection or convective inhibition energy or SIN. And here the surface plays an additional role in driving turbulence, which can overcome convective inhibition. And in a similar spirit, we have probabilistic parameterizations and super parameterization, which again, allow clouds to be coupled to the surface, not just through thermodynamic influences of the surface, but also the dynamics of the turbulent boundary layer. So to illustrate this concept, I ran two sets of daily hindcast experiments in the single column version of CESM for the Southern Great Plains domain for 15 year summer months. And on each day, the surface was perturbed, wetter or drier. And I looked at when the convection was triggered in the model and mapped those days onto a thermodynamic regime or state space with relative humidity uh, in the boundary layer on the Y axis and thermal stratification above, above the boundary layer on the X axis. This is basically revisiting the work of Findel and Altahir, but using a GCM's column physics. And the blue markers are the days where the model predicted convective triggering more frequently in the wet perturbation experiment than in the dry, which we refer to as positive feedback days or wet advantage days. And the left panel is showing results with the Kate based parameterization and the right panel is the UW parameterization, which takes into account energy barriers to convection. And we see no difference uh, in the statistics of triggering events in the regime space with the Kate parameterization. But with the UW parameterization, it really likes to trigger convection over drier soil and the weakly stratified atmospheres that have deeper boundary layers. And this tells us where to look to find negative and positive triggering feedback in observations. So a summary of uh, this talk, meteorological phenomena are drivers of nonlinear interactions that strongly affect water and carbon cycles. Models are only now resolving or parameterizing these interactions with clouds, and we don't know how well land models work at these scales. Paired sites have been very useful, and spatially distributed sites could be used to explore effects of secondary circulations and convective outflows on surface energy balance at storm scales. Dynamics of surface cloud interactions can be informed by measurements of boundary layer wind and thermodynamic profiles. And land model parameter uncertainty remains a, a problem, so there's still value to making leaf level uh, measurements and vertical profiles of soil moisture and vegetation as a constraint on model feedbacks. Thanks for the opportunity to present and thanks for listening.